All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for your patience today. Just a few things at the top, we'll get right to your questions. Uh, first, as you are aware, Israel confirmed today the death of the leader of the Hamas terrorist group, Yahwa Sinwar. We'd refer you to the Israelis to discuss the details, but this is clearly a significant development and a major counterterrorism achievement. As you saw from our readout earlier today, Secretary Austin spoke earlier today with Isra Israeli Minister of Defense Gallant to discuss the reports on the killing of Sinwar and to get an update. I would highlight that when the call occurred, the IDF was still working to confirm Sinwar's death. During the call, Secretary Austin also reaffirmed U.S. support for Israel's right to defend itself and reiterated that the deployment of the terminal high-altitude area defense battery represents the United States' unwavering, enduring, and ironclad commitment to Israel's security. The Secretary also expressed strong support for the immediate release of all remaining hostages and a ceasefire in Gaza. We'll have much more to say from the Department on the death of Sinwar very soon, and we'll keep you updated. Separately, as we announced last evening, U.S. military forces, including U.S. Air Force B-2 bombers, conducted precision strikes against five hardened underground weapons storage locations in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. U.S. forces targeted several of the Houthis' underground facilities, housing various weapons components of the types the Houthis have used to target civilian and military vessels throughout the region. U.S. Central Command is still conducting a post-strike assessment, so I don't have any details to provide on that front other than to say that we struck exactly what we intended to hit. And we'll provide updates as appropriate. As Secretary Austin highlighted in his statement last night, the employment of the B-2 bomber was a unique demonstration of the United States' ability to target facilities that our adversaries seek to keep out of reach no matter how deeply buried underground, hardened, or fortified. And it demonstrates U.S. global strike capabilities to take action against these targets when necessary, anytime, anywhere. It also sends a clear message to the Houthis that there will continue to be consequences for their illegal and reckless attacks which put innocent civilian lives and U.S. and partner forces' lives at risk. Shifting gears, Secretary Austin arrived yesterday in Brussels and today participated in a de-ISIS ministerial, the first session of the NATO Defense Ministerial, and a productive meeting of the NATO-Ukraine Council. In his opening remarks at the de-ISIS ministerial, Secretary Austin highlighted the work over the last decade of the global coalition to defeat ISIS. And I quote, for 10 years, this coalition has tackled the scourge of ISIS. Our success stems from our resolve, our commitment to working together, and our willingness to adapt. These core elements will remain at the heart of the next phase of our mission, end quote. Tomorrow, Secretary Austin will participate in the second session of the NATO Defense Ministerial and engage with his NATO counterparts to discuss strengthening the collective security of the alliance and international support to Ukraine's defense. We'll continue to provide readouts and updates on the Secretary's engagements throughout his travels. And finally, the Department of Defense continues to be fully engaged with FEMA and the whole of government relief efforts related to Hurricanes Helene and Milton, and will continue to work with our federal, state, and local partners to ensure we're supporting and coordinating response efforts in support of our fellow Americans. As of earlier today, the National Guard had more than 4,200 guardsmen, nearly 600 high water vehicles, helicopters, and more than a dozen watercraft from seven states mobilized for the response and recovery mission following Hurricane Milton. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has approximately 450 people supporting with temporary roof support, infrastructure assessment, debris control, flood response, and more. Meanwhile, the department's support for US, the U.S. government's combined response for Hurricane Helene continues as well. The National Guard has roughly 2,500 guardsmen, 65 high-water vehicles, and 11 heli hel helicopters excuse me, from 13 states mobilized. Approximately 1,400 active-duty soldiers are mobilized as well, working with federal, state, and local partners on coordinated response efforts. Active-duty forces have engaged, been engaged in road clearing, commodity distribution, and access to isolated personnel. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has more than 500 personnel engaged in 33 missions across the region, supporting debris control, temporary power, infrastructure assessment, flood control, and safe waterways assessments. Secretary Austin continues to receive updates on these response efforts, and the department continues to be engaged with interagency partners in support of FEMA, the White House state, and local governments. The secretary and his team are also focused on DOD personnel and their families who may be impacted by the hurricanes. With that, I'd be glad to take your questions. We'll start with Associated Press, Tara. Thanks, General Ryder. Um, does Secretary Austin have plans to talk with Minister Gallant again later today 
now that the death has been confirmed and does the building assess that this death creates a greater opportunity for a ceasefire? Will you see Secretary Austin press that further with his counterpart? Um, so I don't have a call to uh, announce now. Uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, I'm, I'm sure Secretary Austin will speak with Minister Gallant uh, at the earliest opportunity. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll read that out uh, when it happens. Uh, in terms of uh, the opportunities that this presents, um, you know, I, I would highlight uh, the President's statement where he uh, highlighted the fact that there is now an opportunity for a day after in Gaza without Hamas in power. And so uh, it does present an opportunity here for a ceasefire. It presents an opportunity for the release of all the, the remaining hostages. And of course, we'll continue uh, to work toward that end. Okay, and then uh, secondly, on the B-2 use last night, is there another aircraft that could have carried the munitions that the B-2 delivered? And if so, why use the B-2 instead of something that was closer to the region? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things on that. Uh, first of all, you know, in the U.S. military, we have, a, as you know, we have a wide range of uh, aviation capability that can carry a wide assortment of munitions. Uh, the B-2 in particular, though, uh, has a large payload. Uh, the ability to uh, operate around the world, uh, as I highlighted in the topper, we can strike anywhere, anytime. Uh, and in this particular strike, using its uh, unique capability and ability to carry a large payload, uh, to deliver munitions that could uh, penetrate and strike these deep underground facilities that were storing components that the Houthis have been using. Uh, again, it also sends a very clear message uh, that we can strike uh, targets uh, of this nature anytime, anywhere from around the world. Thank you. Jennifer. Um, General Ryder, when was the last time the U.S. had a read on where Senwar was, and do you still have uh, troops helping with intel sharing on the ground in Israel? Yeah, so I, I as I'm sure you can appreciate, I'm not going to be able to discuss uh, specific intelligence uh, as you highlight and as the president's statement highlighted. Um, we have had special operations forces and intelligence personnel supporting Israel's uh, hostage recovery efforts, advising on their hostage recovery efforts uh, since shortly after October 7. Uh, and so uh, in that regard, um, you know, by providing them this information, uh, the Israelis have been able to, to go after and look for hostages, uh, as well as find those who have been holding them hostage uh, to include Sinwar. And in terms of the B-2 strike, had you struck these targets before with other aircraft and munitions and had to go back and use the B-2? Or are these, is this a repeat strike? To my knowledge, this was a, uh, this was not a repeat strike. Um, again, this was to go after very specific uh, capabilities that the Houthis were storing uh, deep underground. And it, was it a response to the 23 missiles that were fired on September 27th at the U.S. Uh, destroyers? Uh, this was a response to the continued illegal and reckless action that we see by the Houthis. As you know, this is not the first time that we've struck, uh, but certainly these were unique targets in the, in the sense that they were deep underground targets. Warren. Uh, one question on Israel, uh, one on uh, the B-2s. Did the special operations cell provide any information or intelligence that was used as part of the operations around the killing of Yahya Sinwar? So my understanding, Oren, is that, uh, you know, the short answer is no, this was an Israeli operation. U.S. forces were not directly involved. Um, you know, again, as we've highlighted, we've had a small number of special operations forces that have been advising uh, the Israelis uh, on hostage recovery efforts. Um, and again, as the president's statement highlighted, that included working side by side with their Israeli counterparts to help locate and track Sinwar and other Ham Hamas leaders hiding in Gaza who've been holding people to include Americans hostage since October 7 last year. Can you say whether information or intelligence g generated by the special operations cell there went into previous killings of uh, Hamas leaders like Mohammed Day for, or Issa or others? Uh, again, I'm not going to speak about intelligence other than to say, um, you know, I would just highlight what I just told you in terms of sharing intelligence and information uh, in support of hostage recovery efforts and tracking those who have been holding uh, individuals to include Americans hostage. And then just a very quick question on the B-2s. When the secretary put out a statement last night saying adversaries seeking to essentially place things deep underground in, in, in hardened bunkers, uh, you haven't used the word Iran, but that seems a very clear message to Iran and its underground nuclear facilities. 
Well, as I highlighted in my topper, it was certainly a message to the Houthis and anyone else, uh, potential adversaries that hide things deep underground. Um, it's a message to them as well. Tony. Uh, one of the unique capabilities is that the B-2 can carry the massive ordnance penetrator, the 30,000-pound bomb that the, can go deep, deep, deep. Uh, was that used in the first time here? Yeah, Tony, so for operation security reasons, uh, I'm, I'm just not going to be able to get into the type of ordinance that was employed uh, in this mission. Uh, again, the B-2 is a very versatile aircraft uh, that can carry a wide range of munitions tailored for uh, the particular operation that it's been tasked to do. Uh, and I'll just leave it there. Okay, and Thad, has, has the Thad battery arrived and is it now fully integrated with, uh, with Israel's air defense systems? Uh, so you, you saw our statement earlier in the week uh, that uh, troops have begun to arrive in Israel uh, and the components have begun to arrive uh, in Israel. It's going to be fully operations capable in the near future. I'm not going to get into the specific dates uh, for operation security. I will say that it has been integrated into the uh, Israeli air defense uh, as well as our broader U.S. Uh, efforts, you know, regionally to support the defense of Israel. So you think Navy destroyers possibly or swap data with the Navy destroyers in the Eastern Med for air defense and kind of provide an umbrella? So, th so the way it works is from a f sort of from a theater standpoint, um, you know, the, the U.S. works closely with Israel and, and other partners when it comes to things like air defense to coordinate, uh, to exchange information to ensure that we have a holistic picture uh, and can respond to contingencies throughout the, the area of responsibility to include the supporting the defense of Israel. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, let me go to John. Or, yep. And then I'll go to Charlie. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Thank you very much, General. Uh, this administration has been saying that Hamas have been largely distraught, and that's why Israel can't agree to a ceasefire. And today the Vice President said that Hamas have been decimated. Would you say to your Israeli counterparts, to the Israeli government, that if they made the decision to agree to a ceasefire today, especially after today's development, that that wouldn't be a silly decision militarily, that they can trust that decision? Well, I'm, as I'm sure you can appreciate, I'm not going to provide military to military advice from the podium to our Israeli counterparts. Um, to your point, Hamas has been uh, incredibly degraded, as evidenced by the killing of their leader, a uh, significant number of their forces, and cer certainly uh, do not resemble anything close to what they were on October 7. Uh, or the ability to conduct the kinds of operations we saw them. Um, so I'll leave it to the Israelis to talk about you know, their plans as it relates to Hamas. Uh, but as I highlighted earlier, and as the president highlighted in his statement, uh, the killing of uh, and the death of Sinwar certainly does present an opportunity. Uh, and I'll just leave it there. Can I just one quick follow up? Uh, so as far as I, I understand, this administration thinks that it makes sense right now to agree to a ceasefire. That's pretty clear, I guess. Uh, again, I'm Department of Defense. So broadly speaking, uh, we absolutely support a ceasefire so that we can ensure that humanitarian assistance is getting into Gaza, that the Palestinian people uh, can see a restoration of security and stability. Uh, but we also recognize uh, the threat that Hamas has posed uh, to Israel. Um, and so we'll continue to consult with Israel and our partners in the region, um, but obviously want to see a ceasefire uh, as soon as possible. And most importantly, the release of the hostages uh, that continue to be held by Hamas. Charlie. Thanks, General. Um, Sinwar had American blood on his hands. And the vice president was willing to go a little bit further than you will from there, saying American special operations and intelligence personnel have worked closely with their Israeli counterparts to locate and track Sinwar. He's dead now, so we're not at risk of foiling any sort of intelligence around that. But are you not willing to give us an idea? I'm not, I'm not sure what forces? I said that was contrary to that. I, I, what, I, what I was asked was, was there direct U.S. involvement in this particular Israeli operation? And I said no. Did U.S. Special Forces or intelligence know where Sinwar was when this happened? Uh, again, I'm not going to get into intelligence. What I'm telling you is this was an Israeli operation and that we've been sharing information and intelligence in support of hostage recovery efforts and the tracking of these leaders who have been holding hostages to include Americans. And so, you know, in, in so much as it's helped to inform Israeli operations uh, in general writ large, 
um, you know, certainly it has played a role. But in terms of this particular, um, you know, what happened today or last night, again, I, it's an important question. And I just answered it. So let me go on to Joseph. Thanks. Um, I know you said the secretary spoke to his Israeli counterpart before the um, Sinwar's death was confirmed. But did he, did the secretary, I mean, because as far as we know, you guys haven't received a day after plan from the Israelis in Gaza yet. Is that correct? Um, again, from a Department of Defense standpoint, um, you know, we're continuing to talk with our Israeli counterparts in terms of what that would look like. Certainly, you know, um, it, it will be a complex undertaking, but, you know, more follow on that. And uh, just to follow up on that, does the department think there's anything more to be done militarily in Gaza from the Israeli point of view? Uh, so that's really a question for the Israelis. Again, I think we've been pretty clear that we want to see a ceasefire. We want to see uh, a restoration of uh, a significant flow of humanitarian assistance into Gaza. Um, we want to uh, ensure, though, that Hamas is not in a position to conduct the kinds of attacks that it did on October 7th. Certainly, they are, you know, down for the count in terms of their, their leader. Um, but you know, again, I'll defer to the Israelis to talk about their comfort level on that. Quick, quick, quick last one. Um, what's the secretary going to do in the Vatican? I think he's got that on the last part of his trip. Uh, he's got an official visit, uh, the Vatican City. Again, we'll have a readout of that one when, uh, when he visits there. So let me go to Wafa. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, General. Uh, over the years, Hamas uh, has shown resilience. Um, uh, with replacing uh, leaders when they were killed. So what's different now? Why the assessment within this administration that uh, the killing of uh, Sinwar would remove a significant uh, obstacle in Gaza? Well, I mean, as you highlight, uh, and this is always a challenge with terrorist organizations, is that, you know, you uh, remove the head and another uh, is you know, quickly replaces. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm certain that's something that the Israelis will continue to keep an eye on, as will we. Uh, but I also don't think you can discount the significance, uh, again, from a counterterrorism standpoint. Uh, the, the role that Sinmar has played in leading this organization, uh, also as the, uh, the, the architect, so to speak, of the October 7 Hamas attack against Israel, uh, it's significant uh, that he's been taken off the battlefield. Let me go to the phone here real quick. Dan Lamoth, Washington Post. General, thanks for your time. Um, I wanted to get your assessment. Uh, does, does the Pentagon have an assessment, and maybe would be a better way to put it, uh, of whether with the, uh, the death of Senwar, whether this is a particularly uh, dangerous time uh, for U.S. troops in the region, whether you anticipate any kind of retaliation by uh, any of the militias or ran or, or anything as a result? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, you know, I can't uh, predict the future, and I'm, and I'm not going to speculate. I mean, we already uh, know that the Middle East is uh, in a very tense situation right now and, and have taken significant steps to ensure that our forces that are in the region, as well as our citizens, uh, are protected. And so, uh, as we always do, uh, we'll continue to keep our head on a swivel, protect our forces, support the defense of Israel, and be ready to respond to uh, any variety of contingencies should they arise. Let me go to Phil Stewart, Reuters. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so I, I started to go over this again, but um, I, I'm a little confused. I thought uh, Sinwar was a particularly vexing target um, for intelligence, uh, for the intelligence community. And, and, you know, the comments today suggest that you did have a fix on him at some point and that you, you, you may have contributed uh, to the intelligence picture that, you know, that led to this operation without U.S. support. So could you just explain, you know, did, did U.S. intelligence then, are you, are you suggesting U.S. intelligence had had a fix on Sinwar? Uh, what, what I'm suggesting, Phil, is that, you know, just to be crystal clear, this was an Israeli operation. Uh, there was no U.S. forces directly involved. Uh, the United States has helped contribute uh, information and intelligence as it relates to hostage recovery uh, and the tracking and locating uh, of Hamas leaders uh, who have been responsible for holding hostages. Um, and so certainly that contributes uh, in general uh, to the, the picture. But again, this was an Israeli operation, uh, and I would refer you to them to talk about uh, the details of how the operation went down. Thank you. Uh, let me go to Howard Altman. 
Hey, thanks. Uh, really appreciate it. A couple of questions about Ukraine. One, what is the Pentagon's assessment of how many North Korean troops are in Russia to ready to fight in Ukraine? And secondly, what is the Pentagon's assessment of how the Kursk incursion is going? There are some reports that Ukraine has lost about half the territory invaded. I was hoping you can give me the, the uh, Pentagon's assessment of both of those things. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Howard. Um, definitely seen the, the reporting uh, and the comments about potential uh, DPRK forces, you know, going to Russia or going to Ukraine. I, I can tell you right now, um, we're looking into those. We can't confirm or corroborate those reports. Uh, if true, that would demonstrate uh, an increase uh, in the cooperation between Russia and North Korea. Uh, and I think that would also demonstrate <laughs> Uh, the 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 situation that Russia finds itself in uh, the the dire situation that it finds itself in in terms of um, its forces on the battlefield as you've heard us recently say the the casualties that Russia is experiencing on the front lines uh, are extremely significant uh, upwards of six hundred thousand uh, killed or wounded uh, and so uh, it just demonstrates uh, the desperation in terms of identifying additional forces. Uh, for their for their military, but it's something that we'll continue to keep a close eye on. And then I'm sorry, your second question. This, the second question was about Kursk. There's some reporting that Ukraine has lost about half of the territory it gained in that Kursk incursion. Um, I'm just wondering if the Pentagon has assessment of how that's going. Based on the information I have, that that is not accurate. Uh, there has been some uh, incremental, uh, a small amount of territory retaken by. Uh, the Russians in Kursk, uh, but at this stage, uh, nothing uh, that we would consider significant. Okay, come back to the room here. John. Thank you, General. Uh, in President's statement, he used a very uh, active language in terms of the um, involvement of the U.S. intelligence and providing this information to the Israeli side. Uh, is this cooperation was from September 7th up until now? And uh, was it a two-way intelligence sharing, or you only giving them information that you have? Yeah, so uh, as we've said before, and, and we've talked about this publicly, um, we sent a small number of special operations forces uh, to Israel to work out of the embassy to support and you know, to advise the Israelis on hostage recovery efforts. And to put this into context, remember that there are American citizens that are being held hostages, so it's appropriate that American uh, forces would be assisting and advising the Israelis on, on those recovery efforts. Um, the president actually is comparing this with, I mean, putting, mentioning Osama bin Laden's uh, death as well. Um, so it, it sounds like the U.S. sees this like the killing of the group that was responsible of that attack, which Israel used to show it as uh, the 9-11 of Israel. Uh, so do you think that this is uh, going to be like an opportunity to uh, uh, cease fire? Uh. Well, again, I, I think the president's statement speaks for itself. And as I already highlighted uh, in that statement, he highlights the fact that this is an opportunity for a day after in Gaza without a Hamas. And so I'll just leave it there. Constantine. Thanks, Pat. Um, <clears throat> uh, going back to the uh, THAAD deployment, since, as you say, you know, most of the unit appears to now be in Israel, are you able to offer any more specifics as to uh, what the unit is or where they came from, what army base they were deployed from? Um, Constantine, I don't have more to provide for, for you from the podium here other than to say uh, the unit did deploy from the U.S., um, and it's an air defense capability that will be integrated into the, the broader air defense capabilities that we're providing in the support of uh, Israel's defense. Okay, and sl slightly related question, um, you know, as, as we sort of look forward to Israel's future, you said, you know, the flow of humanitarian aid is important for it to resume. Does the DOD see itself as playing a significant role in getting that humanitarian aid into Israel? Uh, so right now, from a U.S. government standpoint, of course, USAID uh, is the is the lead organization on U.S. efforts to get aid in there. Certainly, the the department uh, helps to advise, and um, you know, will support as necessary to include on the diplomatic front. You know, as you 
have seen in some of our readouts recently from Secretary Austin's conversations with Minister Gallant. That has been a, a topic of discussion and continues to be an important topic of discussion. So um, if we have any, you know, I don't have anything to announce right now, but if that changes, we'll let you know. Yes, sir. Thank you. I have several on Ukraine. Um, first, President Zelensky said that the latest weapons package for Ukraine we saw yesterday included some long-range weapons. Was this attack guns or something else? And could you also specify which air-to-ground munitions were included in this package? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. I'm, I'm not going to be able to go into more detail beyond what was in the readout. Secondly, uh, does the Pentagon support the implementation of Zelensky's victory plan that he presented these days, specifically when it comes to lifting restrictions on long, long range strikes inside Russia and continuation of Ukraine's military operations on Russian territory? Um, well, you know, I, I know that uh, at the, the NATO uh, defense ministerials uh, and in his consultations, uh, you know, in, in his conversations and consultations with his Ukrainian counterpart, um, you know, we continue to learn more about uh, the president's victory plan. Um, I can tell you what Secretary Austin does support is uh, Ukraine's uh, success in terms of defending their sovereign territory and, and the freedom of the Ukrainian people. And so we're going to continue to work closely with the Ukrainians, uh, closely with our allies and partners to ensure uh, that we understand Ukraine's needs uh, and that we're supporting their uh, capability requirements on the battlefield. Zelensky also said that if they start implementing this victory plan now, it may be possible to end the war next year. Does the Pentagon agree with that assessment? Uh, again, I, I don't have anything to provide on that other than, you know, we're going to continue to support Ukraine uh, for the long haul. We're going to continue to ensure we understand and are supporting their battlefield requirements. Nancy. Um, the, re the reports are that there was a, t a tank round that brought down the facility where Senwar was. Does the U.S. know what kind of tank round and whether it was a U.S. provided one? I, I don't. I'd have to refer you to the IDF. And then in your announcement about the deployment of the THAAD, one reason that was listed for deploying it was to defend Americans in Israel. I'd like to know if the department is considering also deploying <coughs> any sort of defense to defend American citizens in Lebanon. Uh, I don't have any new announcements to make, but, you know, by virtue of the fact that we have uh, DDGs, uh, destroyers rather, uh, and other capabilities in the region. We certainly, again, place the safety and security of American citizens, whether they be in Lebanon or Israel, uh, at the top of the priority list. And so uh, we continue to work very hard to ensure that all Americans are safe. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, you know, as, as we see Iranian uh, Houthi uh, missiles uh, that, are, that are heading towards uh, Israel or towards that vicinity, you know, we certainly have the capability to take those down. But uh, I would just emphasize that regardless of where American citizens are, it's always going to be a top priority for us to protect them. Are there any force posture changes or changes in the sort of security posture in light of Sinwar's death? Do you, is there anything you tell us in terms of any shifts that you're making? Uh, no announcements to make. Um, as I highlighted earlier, we have a robust posture in the region um, and we'll continue to do everything we can to protect Americans, protect U.S. forces and support the defense of Israel. Time for a few more. Janie. Thank you, Senator. Two questions uh, on uh, Russia, North Korea, and Ukraine. Russia took North Korea's side and uh, criticized uh, South Korea for carrying out drone provocation in Pyongyang. And Russia submitted a bill to the House of Representatives to ratify the Russia North Korea Mutual Military Cooperation Treaty and declared that it would provide military support in, in case of conflict between North and South Korea. How does the United States view Russia's direct intervention in the South and North Korea's conflict? Um, you know, Janie, I would say again that we're going to continue to work closely uh, with our ROK allies uh, to support their defense, um, and I'll, I'll just leave it there. Okay. A second question. Uh, Ukraine President Zelensky told the press that North Korea's troops are training in the Russian Far East and are active in the Ukraine border area. If it happens,